Hello, very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Shanti. Coming up on this week's program, Lebanon's migrant domestic workers are facing mental, physical and sexual abuse under a sponsorship system. This is according to a new report published by Amnesty International. A Bahraini rights group says sexual abuse and torture have become widespread in prisons in the Persian Gulf nation. We'll be speaking to the founder of that organization and former MP Jawad Fairouz. Also coming up, another episode of Flavors of Iraq by Furat Alani, a look at the deep changes the country underwent under the US occupation. Thank you for watching Middle East Matters. Now, for the first time in five years, the Islamic State Group's propaganda arm has released what it claims to be a new message from its leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. In the 18-minute video, the fugitive speaks of the end of the battle in Baghouz, the extremist group's last stronghold in Syria, while also discussing the bombings in Sri Lanka that left 250 people dead. After the video emerged, officials in the U.S. said that they would track down and defeat surviving IS group leaders. Next, a new report published by Amnesty International, which says that domestic workers in Lebanon are facing physical and mental abuse at the hands of their employers. This as a result of a migrant sponsorship system in the country known as Kafala. Just days after arriving in Lebanon three years ago, Nora wished she'd never come. She left her home in Ethiopia to work as a housemaid in a private household in Beirut. But the father harassed and eventually assaulted her. One time, coming One time I didn't see him. I was in a room alone. I was cleaning, so he came in. There was nothing I could do. He said to me, I'm going to have sex with you. He did the same thing three times. Imagine every day I have the same fear. Nora's case is far from unique. The laws for domestic workers in Lebanon are dictated by the kafala system a program that Amnesty International has called inherently abusive. It does not protect workers against human rights abuses, including verbal and physical abuse, restriction of movement and deprivation of food and salaries. Employers are also allowed to confiscate the passports of their workers. This issue was brought up at the launch of Amnesty's campaign in Beirut. When I arrived at the airport, the woman took my passport and all my documents, and then she hid them. She threw my bag away. They think that we are not human beings. I could not leave because my sponsor did not allow me. She said that if I want to return, I should pay her back the $1,500. What can I do if I don't have money and my passport? This means if they escape, they could be arrested and detained for being undocumented. For its report, Amnesty investigators interviewed 32 women. They registered six cases of severe physical abuse, eight of forced labor and four of human trafficking. These workers are excluded from the protection of labor laws and they are subjected to a sponsorship system that links the residency status of a worker with a contract with the employer. This system makes the worker vulnerable to exploitation. We have released the Amnesty International report that aims to end the sponsorship system and include the workers in the labor law. Campaigners have described it as modern-day slavery and hope the report will put pressure on the government to protect those who've traveled halfway across the world seeking a better life in Lebanon. Moving on to a meeting between the French president and King Khalifa of Bahrain at the Elysee Palace this week. On the agenda, the conflicts in Yemen and Syria. Meanwhile, rights groups have been calling on Emmanuel Macron to draw attention to the Persian Gulf nation's dismal rights records. For more, I'd like to bring in Jawad Fairouz. He's a former Bahraini MP and the chairman of Salon for Democracy and Human Rights. Jawad, Thanks so much for being with us here on Middle East Matters. Your organization has just published a report on a sexual torture of detainees. What's your general assessment of the human rights situation in Bahrain today? Unfortunately, since 2011 till now, the human rights violations is escalating. We have um, monitoring the, uh, this escalation through recording 
many type of the statistics related to the first the number of the detainees. The total number is exceeding 4,000. We are now in prison. We have 5,000. And the more than 36 cases of death penalty were already three of them already been executed. And we have many cases of the life sentences, uh, political uh, isolations of the all uh, political uh, groups and uh, the leaders of the opposition are behind the bar and definitely uh, uh, human rights defenders and one of them prominent uh, human rights defenders Nabil Rajab and we can see targeting the activists in general by revoking their nationality so all these human rights uh, violations are so worrying and we cannot see that there is any adaptation of any type of the reforms in Bahrain neither human rights or political reforms. Now, Jawad, in addition to everything that you mentioned, Bahrain is also revoking the nationality of its citizens. There are reportedly 985 uh, cases to date. Yes, it is very warning and alarming where Bahrain yet revoked 985. But uh, we think that uh, the different types of the use of national uh, um, uh, nationality law or um, uh, anti-terrorist acts law to uh, uh, oppose uh, all the activists and try to revoke the nationality is, is very dangerous issues. And yet um, uh, all of them uh, either behind the bar or they are living abroad and many of them has been expelled out of the country. And unfortunately, I am one of those whose nationality at the beginning been revoked. Jawad, we'll speak about that in a moment. But the king has made a pledge to return some of those nationalities. Is that something that we can trust? We wish that uh, that amendment to be cancelled instead of reinstating their uh, nationality. And I, we hope that uh, there are going to be a, a total package of the human rights reform, starting with the legislation to be revised and this legislation to be according to the international conventions, not just to restrain all those who were there in, initially their nationality has been re revoked. And it will be repeated once again by any court order. So best thing is to revise all the local legislation to be accordingly to the international laws and at the same time never ever nationality to be revoked according to any type of the penal code or targeting any uh, due to the, any political reasons. Joad, very briefly, everything that you've just talked about, detention, being tortured, nationality revoked, these are all very personal experiences for you, aren't they? Yes, yes. As I um, uh, mentioned that I am being one of them, and uh, definitely when you uh, lose your nationality, you, you lose all your basic rights, your political civil rights, and uh, then the government will think that you don't have right to stay in the country. They will expel uh, you out, and then, then you will not, you'll be sacked from your job. You don't have access to your bank accounts, and even any newborn babies you have, they will be stateless. So it is really very, very the, the dangerous uh, violations, and uh, if you lose it, you will lose all your other rights. Jawad Dalferouz, former Bahraini MP and the founder of a rights group, thank you so much for speaking to us here on Middle East Matters. Over to New York, where Iran's foreign minister over the weekend offered to negotiate a prisoner swamp with the U.S. This was the first proposal of its kind in what appeared to be a diplomatic overture amid deteriorating conditions between Tehran and Washington. Javad Zarif also uh, slammed various officials in the U.S. administration for seeking a confrontation with the Islamic Republic. This a week after the State Department threatened sanctions against countries that continue to import oil from Iran. We end with uh, another episode of Flavors of Iraq by Franco-Iraqi journalist Furat Alani. This week, the protagonist moves back to Baghdad to work as a correspondent for French media. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. It was 2004, nine years after my last visit, and I was back in Iraq. At 24, I'd become a journalist, and I was working as a local correspondent for French media. Baghdad had fallen. Saddam Hussein had been captured. He was set to be tried and executed. Until the formation of an Iraqi government, the country was under U.S. administration. There were Americans everywhere. I moved in with my aunt. 
She gave me news of my cousin Ahmed. When I met him as a child, he used to unload crates at a market. Lately, he'd been working for an anti-American insurgent group. He had just been arrested. Ahmed was tortured at Abu Ghraib, Baghdad's central prison. He was then transferred to Camp Buka, a huge detention center in the south. While in jail, he was informed of the birth of his son. Finally, after a year behind bars, he was released. Ahmed could return home. He decided to join Fallujah's police force. At the time, work was hard to come by, and being a police officer guaranteed a monthly income. A week after his leaving prison, my aunt told me that Ahmed had been found dead with a CD on his chest. On it, footage of his interrogation and execution. Al-Qaeda viewed police officers as traitors on the government payroll. Iraq was stuck between a rock and a hard place. On the one side, Americans. On the other, new jihadist groups. That's it for us. Thank you for watching.